Yakima Valley Community College Radiologic Sciences Program presents Radiographic Positioning GI Tract. We're going to spend this session focusing on the alimentary canal. The alimentary canal is the GI tract from mouth to anus. I'll be demonstrating several positions in a little while, um, but let me explain that protocols or what projections or positions that you take will vary very vastly between radiologists, between um, the, the physical imaging department setups, between patients. So my approach when I demonstrate the positioning will be to, to show you a, a wide range of different scenarios that you may be dealing with. Um, we need to talk about a few of those situations now. Um, the examination might be inclusive of the entire GI tract or only portions of it. For instance, you might be just focused on the esophagus. You might be just focused on the upper GI or the stomach, which may or may not include some of the esophagus. It might be a small bowel follow-through series, or it might be a colon exam or large intestine. Many times we refer to a uh, comprehensive study as a complete GI, which is predominantly an upper GI or the stomach focus and the colon focus. If you are faced with a protocol for a complete GI, it's important that you do the colon examination first. So the enema is presented into the large bowel and the patient is able to um, empty out their colon and most of the barium will leave and then you do the upper GI series. Um, that's one thing to keep in mind if you're doing multiple exams in this scenario. An esophagus, you might do that first, have the patient drink the barium for the esophagus, and then you go into stomach filming after that. Uh, again, a lot of different options are going to be available to you. Every institution will have a protocol procedure manual that you can look up um, different doctor routines. And this demonstration will be covering probably 90% of possibilities that you will see. So not only are you going to be dealing with different scenarios, it's patient habitus that is going to be probably your biggest challenge. And our four categories of patient habitus deals with sthenic, that's the average patient build. You have hyposthenic, which is a smaller than average build. You have an asthenic build, which is very tiny or very petite, especially if the patient's elderly. And then you have the hypersthenic, which is an obese type of patient. So again, four different types of body habitus, sthenic being average, hyper being excessive to normal, hypo just under average, and asthenic is very, very tiny. So when I do the demonstration today, I will be emphasizing those different body habituses. Um, Generally speaking, an upper GI consists of, well, not the upper GI, but the gastrointestinal system. The doctors will do some kind of floral procedure to begin with. They will watch the patient ingest the barium. They will um, insert the en uh, barium through an enema procedure. They might be taking gastrographin if the patient is suspected of having a uh, visceral perforation or the patient might be heading for surgery for some reason. But generally speaking, the doctor does the preliminary review of the patient under fluoroscopic procedures. The physician leaves and then we as technologists will come in and take what we call overhead projections or films after the floral. And that's what the, the purpose of the demonstration is today not floral setup or not what you do during fluoroscopy, but it's going to focus on the overhead projections afterwards. And I will start with a logical order from the esophagus, stomach, we'll talk about small bowel, and then we'll talk about colon. Um, uh, let's go to the table. We'll see you in a minute. I've got our patient, Kristen, set up for an RAO of the esophagus. Again, I'm going to start from the mouth and work my way down through the system. Uh, and remember, you may be taking this in different orders. The doctor's protocol will actually dictate what uh, precise positions or projections you will be doing. 
But let's take a look at our patient here. For an esophagus, we generally use a 14 by 17 film. I have the ID to the top, and the right marker is moved in a ways because I will be showing collimation on the two sides. The film's edge will be level with your patient's mouth. The top of the film will be level with your patient's mouth. The esophagus, the patient swallows barium, and the stomach is approximately here. So you can see the esophagus will be the focus of this film here. Now I'm going to have you focus on our patient's back and look at this crosshair here. I'm going to try to demonstrate her spine is right here, the spinous process. And this crosshair is anterior um, to her spinous process approximately two inches. It will depend on the degree of obliquity that you position your patient in, but you've got to remember that the esophagus is always going to be anterior to the spine no matter what, pa uh, no matter what position the patient is in. So here's the spinous process. We know the vertebral body and then the esophagus. Another trick that you can use, here's Kristen's neck and I've got this crosshair coming right down almost the center of her neck, a little bit on the anterior side. So I know that between being a couple inches off the spine and coming right down her neck that I have not missed her esophagus side to side. Again, the film's edge will be level with the mouth. The trick here is to gain your patient's cooperation. Explain to them that it's going to be necessary for us to swallow the barium that's in the cup for them to keep drinking and to try to take big mouthfuls and take big swallows in order to catch the barium in the esophageal tract. And we're choosing to do the patient in a recumbent position because gravity will, will assist us in it. You would position the patient exactly the same way at the vertical board, but as they swallow, the gravity will assist that barium going down faster, whereas when they're recumbent, at least swallowing the barium goes not with the flow of barium. So it's our recommendation that you do do patients for esophageal studies in a recumbent mode. Again, your option would be to do it in a vertical mode. Again, we talked about cooperation with the patient and they have a cup of barium. There's a straw and again, you've explained to the patient what your job is and, and I'm going to have you taking a deep, uh, excuse me, taking a big mouthful and watch them. She actually has a straw and then you'd go to the your exposure panel and, and okay, take in another big mouthful, you know, swallow it. And you're trying to watch the epiglottis and uh, recommend on about the fourth swallow, you watch the epiglottis and, and when it goes up, when it moved up, the esophagus, esophagus opened up and the barium went down. So you try to press the expose button at the time that you see the epiglottis go into a vertical motion. And hopefully we catch the barium in the esophagus. Uh, again, the positioning, RAO is a, is a very common um, oblique for esophagus, uh, usually 30 to 45 degree obliquity. Another common position that might be used for an esophagus is a lateral position. And you might do a left lateral or you might do a right lateral. For the sake of demonstrating here in the camera angle, we're going to turn our patient into a right lateral mode. Oh, there you go. And patient can face the camera. Get them comfortable in a true lateral position. Arms forward. And then they're going to hold the cup again. Make sure they're straight on the table and in a lateral position, checking their hips and their shoulders. And the film's edge will remain at the level of the mouth. You would change cassettes, and with the right lateral, I'd use a right marker, again, moved in a ways. And the film's edge will be level with the patient's mouth, and then Think back, what I said a few minutes ago, where is the esophagus? Where is the esophagus in relationship to the spine? It's just anterior to the spine. So we're going to slide the tabletop towards me. And I'm going to look at the patient's body. And there's their spine. 
That would be the mid-axillary line. You know that from your thoracic vertebrae and your lumbar spine vertebrae exposures. And then the esophagus is just anterior to the spine. And I can also look at the patient's neck, that trick that I talked to you before, and make that crosshair come right down there. Okay? And the instructions to the patient would be the same. Let them know that it's important for them to take big swallows. When you say that it is difficult to catch barium in the esophageal tract and have them take about four swallows and make your exposure, if you can see the epiglottis go up or you just hope luck is with you if you can't see the epiglottis go up. Uh, you might do other obliques, but again, if you remember the film's edge level with the mouth and where the esophagus is, is anterior to the spine, you'd be able to do any position that a physician would ask you to do for an esophagus. Okay. Some, some techs like to take the barium and make it thicker, or there's gastrographin. Sometimes there's barium tablets that patients take. Sometimes it's a cotton, little cotton ball dipped in some barium if they're trying to detect a foreign object. So you're going to run into all kinds of scenarios out there doing your GI work. We're going to uh, move on now to a, a stomach exam, and since our patient's in a right lateral position, we might as well um, position for a right lateral. Again, these, I'm going to demonstrate them not in any set order. Uh, if your patient is left in a supine position, in an AP position, you would start with your APs first. If they were left in a prone position, start with your PAs first. What you want to keep in mind is that you don't make the patient move one way, move them back, move them back another way. Think logical and have your patient move, say, in a circle, one direction or the other. So the patient has to move as little as possible. Now, the big films are for the esophagus. We'll, we'll move to 10 by 12s for most of the stomach or the upper GI films. And we will not use an L or, R or an R marker. We will just use tech initials. I'm placing the cassette lengthwise in the bucky tray for a right lateral. And the ID is to the top. Column 8 to your 10 by 12 lengthwise. And she's in a, in a true lateral position, shoulders vertical, the pelvis vertical, truly lateral. And then I'm going to find the tip of the scapula and the iliac crest, and I'm going to go halfway. Can you see my fingers here? I found the tip of the scapula and the iliac crest, and I'm going to go halfway. That's my halfway reference mark. That is approximately the level of L1 or L2. Okay. Here's the crest. L3 is two inches above. And you can see that my halfway mark is approximately at the level of L1 or L2. Ballingers will give you that option that you should be centered at L1 or L2. We're giving you a more precise centering, giving you something to go for. And again, it was the tip of the scapula, iliac crest, halfway, and then a little bit below. I, I think I failed to tell you a minute ago that you should go an inch below. So let me recap. Tip of the scapula, iliac crest, halfway, and one inch below. That will put you at the level of L, lumbar spine, L1 or L2. You can confirm by iliac crest, two inches above is L3. So you can see that I am approximately at L1 or L2. That's for the vertical placement. And I consider Kristen to be a sthenic body habitus, an average level body habitus. Now, the front and back plane, I'll try to tighten her sweatshirt here a little bit. And her mid-coronal plane, I'll try to demonstrate it with my hand right here. There's her mid-coronal plane. I'm going to want the crosshair approximately one and a half inches anterior to the mid-coronal plane. So I'm going to come around and float the tabletop backwards a little bit. Mid-coronal plane, 
and you want to be one and a half an inches anterior. And I'm going to have you focus on the tabletop here. When I did that, look what happened. I'm actually x-raying tabletop. I have my 10 by 12 collimated field set with the gauge, and if I'm showing tabletop, I'm giving the doctor no valuable information there. So I'm going to adjust that centering a little bit to give him more of the body, give her more of the body, to see perhaps more of the stomach or small intestines. So one of the things that we just experienced now is, is your instructors or you as a tech are going to give you certain reference points. Um, I'll recap that one in a minute. But if you ever x-ray tabletop, the rule is that's not valuable information. Alter your positioning. Do not demonstrate tabletop. Give the physicians the body to look at. Give them some GI to look at. Right lateral, tip of the scapula, iliac crest. Divide that halfway and go down one inch for sthenic body habitus. Mid-coronal plane, you should be anterior to the mid-coronal plane approximately an inch and a half, but since we were showing tabletop here, I actually moved the patient this way to include more of the body. And this would be a right lateral. Change cassettes, and I'm going to go crosswise, and we're going to have the patient roll onto their stomach. And they're going to go into a PA position. Both arms up, both arms down. And I'm going to a crosswise mode because the stomach, when you're in an oblique or a lateral position, the stomach tends to elongate. So the film goes lengthwise. When the patient is in an AP or a PA position, the stomach tends to go more transverse. So we want the 12-inch axis to be wider across the body. And I'm putting the ID blocker towards you towards the tech. And here's her left side. The fundus of the stomach would be here. And then the body and the pylorus comes to the patient's right side. So if we track that on a film, I want you to look here for a second on the cassette. Fundus is on the left side. And it circles around into the body. And the pylorus ends up over here. So I'm looking at the ID blocker and I'm going, but it might be into the fundus. That's a true statement. It might be into the fundus. So if we reverse the cassette, here's the fundus, circles around to the body, comes over to the pylorus, and now the ID blocker might be into the pyloric region. So you're kind of in trouble, perhaps, either way. Well, if you were to recognize the fact that say 80% of pathological conditions happen in the pyloric region, that's the area you want to protect. You want to put the ID blocker towards the fundus then. You want to keep the pyloric region free of possible obstacles. That's our rationale for putting the ID blocker towards you as the technologist. You've got to change the direction of your collimated field. We do not have automatic collimation here, so now I have to make sure I go 10 by 12 crosswise. Tube and the film are lined up, so now all I have to do is focus on the patient. We know the stomach is on the left side, slightly off of midline, so I just moved the patient to that area. Now I'm going to use my reference marks again. I'm going to find the tip of the scapula top of the iliac crest, feeling posteriorly, and go halfway. Okay. Again, tip of the scapula, iliac crest, go halfway. That should be at the proximate level of L1, L2. Here's the crest, two inches above is L3. So you can see that I've confirmed that I am at the level of L1 or L2. And then side to side, here's her spine right here. And I'm one inch to the left of the spine. Because again, the stomach is fairly midline. It is on the left side, but just off of midline. So I'm happy with that placement. Then I like to look at the edge of the body here and make sure I'm not x-raying tabletop. 
Now, Ballinger's actually recommends that you take the spine and the lateral aspect and center over the left side, but you can tell if I scooted the patient any further that way, I'd be x-raying tabletop. So I'm going back to that rule of thumb, x-ray tabletop gives the doctors no valuable information at all, do not x-ray tabletop. So our centering is a little bit different than Ballinger's, and we've just given you rationale behind that. And I've demonstrated a couple stomach positions for you. Um, so we need a little bit of a break, so I'm going to talk in theory some more. I mentioned that Kristen was a sthenic body habitus, or average. The positioning reference marks that I'm giving you today are baseline for the sthenic body habitus. And please recall for just a minute what the four body habitus were. You've got average, you have above average, you have slightly below average, and then you have tiny. Okay, let's focus on Christian's back because it's really easy to demonstrate on a PA what we would do for the various body habituses. Again, this is a sthenic setup. You've got your tip of your scapula, your iliac crest, and your halfway. Well, if Christian was overweight, she would be considered hypersthenic. And what you do, instead of being halfway, you move up one inch. You move superiorly because the stomach, the adipose, tends to make the stomach higher in the patient. So instead of being halfway, you're up one inch. This would be if Kristen was sthen uh, excuse me, hyposthenic. Okay. Halfway mark is for sthenic. Now, if she's underweight, you would take the iliac crest, tip of the scapula, go halfway as your baseline, and then you would drop down one inch for the hypo, and if she was asthenic, that's even tinier, the stomach drops even more, you're going to be two inches below. Okay. Again, you know, don't x-ray tabletop, the side-to-side -side method. So, hyperpatient, hypersthenic patient, the stomach is higher, center a little higher than normal. Sthenic, we're making you memorize those part film reference points for the sthenic patient. Hyposthenic, just, uh, just under average, so you drop down an inch, and asthenic, you actually drop down two inches. Okay? Hyper, sthenic, hypo, and asthenic in one inch increments for the different body habitus. Okay, let's go on with another demonstration. Okay, uh, we did a right lateral. We've now done the patient PA. We're going to, um, it would be hard for you to see a left lateral, but it would be the same as for a right lateral. Okay, let's, let's try to do it anyway. The camera, we, I can talk you through it. So, Kristen, would you face that wall for a left lateral? Left laterals aren't real common, but you might see it. And if you remember, when a patient is in a lateral or an oblique position, the stomach tends to elongate. So we're going to go 10 by 12 lengthwise. Adjust the collimation back to a 10 by 12 field size. We're going to straighten our patient up so they're straight on the table. And they're in a lateral position. If the patient was squirming on you or uncomfortable, go ahead and put a sponge between their knees. That will make them more comfortable. And I'll work from this side of the table. I think we can see here. I'm going to use the tip of the scapula, iliac crest. We'd go halfway and then down one inch. This would be for sthenic. And then mid-coronal plane. I want to be a little anterior to it, but from my view now, I'm actually x-raying tabletop, so I'm not going to move her forward to, to truly set the one and a half inches anterior to the mid-coronal plane to the center of the film. Now, obese patients, you're going to have a lot of tissue out here, and you need to keep in mind that a um, patient might be large, but they could be firm. Organs are going to be, tend to be held in place. If a patient is large and not 
firm, the stomach will tend to fall more forward. So what we're giving you are not precise <laughs> positioning reference marks, they're guidelines. And you must think of patient habitus and think of patient condition and, and adjust accordingly. That's one of the pleasures of our jobs because we're not button pushers. We do have to think through this. Okay? So this would be a left lateral, tip of scapula, iliac crest, halfway and then down an inch. This would be for sthenic. What if she was hypersthenic? What if she was larger? This is sthenic. This would be hypersthenic. This would be hyposthenic. And this would be asthenic. Again, at approximately the L level of L1 or L2. And if she was really tiny, we're actually at the level of L3. And little tiny are your 80, 90-year-old pound um, little old men and little old ladies. That There's no muscle tone and everything shifts down. I've actually taken an x-ray of a stomach that was entirely in the pelvis uh, because of muscle tone. Everything just drops. Okay. Kristen, I'll have you turn on to your back. There you go. Notice we're having her go in one direction. I don't want her tipping back and forth. What way should I put the cassette, gang? Crosswise. APs and PAs, the film goes crosswise. Again, the ID blocker will be towards us. Her fundus is here and her pylorus is here. Fundus pylorus. In the AP, the ID blocker is not a problem at all. But to help minimize your memorization, for crosswise films, we put the ID blocker towards the tech. And when the film is lengthwise, we put it superiorly. Again, trying to make your life a little simpler in memorization, memorizing things. Change your film collimation to match your film. Okay. And now the reference part for a sthenic patient. Again, the stomach is fairly midline slightly to the left side. I'm going to use her xiphoid process and I'm going to be one inch inferior to that, one inch below, and I'm going to be one inch to the left because the stomach is slightly off to the left side. I'm going to look over my patient and make sure I'm not x-raying tabletop and I'm not x-raying tabletop so I'm happy with that position. If she was high persthenic, we'd be level with the xiphoid. This asthenic is one inch below the xiphoid. Hypersthenic is one inch above the standard line, which is actually right at the xiphoid. And then hypo is one inch below, and asthenic is two inches below the sthenic mark. Okay. On somebody who's very thin, they're not going to be very wide. You're probably going to be centered right at the midline because you're going to be showing x-ray tabletop over there. Again, you adjust for different body habituses. Okay. Um, Kristen, the only one I think we have left is an LPO. We did an AP and a PA. We did an RAO. We did the right and left lateral, so an LPO. Okay. We're going to, raise, we're going to bring this arm over your chest. Just bend the knee slightly, and we're going to roll you like a log. 30, 45 degree obliquity again. If they have troubles holding in place, don't hesitate to use a positioning sponge. Is that more comfortable? Yeah. Cassette will go lengthwise. ID to the top. Fix your field size. And the xiphoid again. Find the xiphoid. And I'm going to be two inches below the xiphoid and approximately two inches to the right of the xiphoid. I'm going to look at the patient and I'm going to see that it's centered. Her body is centered to the frame. I don't know if the camera can look at this angle. The reference again is two inches below and two inches to the right of the xiphoid. But when I looked at Kristen, I'm going to alter that a little bit because of the degree of obliquity, and I'm only going to be approximately one inch to the right of the xiphoid. I'm looking at the collimated field, this box, and I'm centering it to her body. And if the collimated field is centered to the body, there's no way you're going to miss the stomach. Okay? 
Now, if a patient is really obese and the tissue falls this way, you're going to have to tend to shift and be centered more over here. Okay, again, you have to use some logic in finding the stomach side to side. Okay, I've centered her body and I am two inches below the xiphoid. Again, that's approximately the level of L1 or L2. Here's the crest. Two inches above would be L3. So you can see I'm approximately L2. So I'm happy with that centering. Okay, we're going to let Kristen relax for a minute. If the patient was hyper, you'd raise the central ray. You know, you'd have to center higher. Hypo, you center one inch below the reference and ascenic two inches below the reference. If there's a small bowel follow through, the small bowel bo follow through, consider them as KUBs. If there's a small bowel follow through, generally speaking, you should make note of the time barium was first ingested by the patient. Then they normally do a few overhead films for the stomach series. Then they will do the follow-throughs. And the follow-throughs are basically straight KUBs. They may be APs or PAs. Um, think logically now. Where is the small bowel? Is it anterior or is it posterior? tends to be in the front of the patient. So PAs are actually, the small bowel would be closer to the film, so when you can do PAs, it's actually better. But many times the elderly cannot go onto their stomach, so you would do APs. What the doctor protocol calls for, that's what you'll perform. Or logically, if given the choice, you prefer to do PAs with APs as a secondary backup you'll get good films, but they just won't be as good as PAs. And the small bowel follow-through, the exam may last an hour, hour and a half. It may go three or four hours. Until the barium reaches the ileal cecal valve, you are taking intermittent radiographs. In the beginning of the series, they're usually 15 minutes apart. Uh, later in the series, they're probably a half an hour apart. The doctors will evaluate every radiograph after you take it, and then they will give you an indication of when to take the next one. So we're going to pretend that this one's our 15-minute follow-through, and we're going to have our patient be onto our, onto our stomach. If you're not doing a small bowel follow-through, but the protocol calls for a 14 by 17 of the stomach, try to do that one near the end of the procedure, because the purpose of the big film is for small bowel. The purpose of a big 14 by 17 film is not for the upper GI, it's for the small bowel. And the small bowel is distal to the stomach. Okay, so big film, we're going to put her MSP to the center of the film. I'm going to get her straight on the table. Fourteen by seventeen cassette. The big films you use markers little films, just initials, and I would actually mark how many minutes this was. I would have a 15-minute marker, say, here as well. In the lab here, we don't have those markers, but in the hospitals, you will. So a 15-minute marker here might be half an hour, could be 45 minutes, could be an hour. Whatever the time frame was, that's what you'll put on your cassette. And collimation is 17 by 14, and if the patient allows, you can come in tighter. I'm going to put the mid-sagittal plane to the center of the film, arms either both up or both down. I can collimate just a little on this patient, and I'm going to position as if it's a KUB, just to show you here. Here's your iliac crest, and I'm putting the center of the film to the iliac crest. Now what I like to do is find the stomach after I do a KUB. I'm validating my decision that it's okay to do a uh, KUB. Here's the tip of her scapula, iliac crest, halfway is the stomach. The stomach is right there. And I look at the film's edge and you can see that the film's edge is going to clear that stomach. So I am happy with this patient being on a 14 by 17 film with the iliac crest to the center because I verify that I'm actually putting the stomach here 
and small bowel goes down here. Now, if I had a seven foot two person, I'm not going to be able to do a straight KUB. I'm going to have to center above the crest because the stomach will be higher. Your intent is to put the stomach at the top of the film, small bowel in the center of the film. Now, during a small bowel follow through, maybe an hour and a half into the procedure, the doctor sees something on your overhead films and they may say, let's go do floral. You need to be ready for that. They may want to do an overhead spot in that case. And then you come back to taking your overhead film. So be ready for anything with the small bowel. And one of the best hints that I can give you is to make sure the patient knows that this exam may take a while, that the actual length of the exam has nothing to do with you or how busy your department may appear to be. It is solely dependent upon how long it takes the barium to reach the ileal cecal valve. And every patient is different. Could be an hour, it could be 12 hours. So make sure they understand it and then keep the patient posted as to their progress of the barium following down into the uh, small bowel reaching the ileocecal valve. We're going to take just a pause for a second and be back. We'll continue today's lesson with um, pictures of the colon, the big films. And again, um, in talking about the various positions today, I've started from mouth and we're going into the large bowel, but if you're going to combine these and the large bowel is included, you will generally do the large bowel first so the colon can empty out and then you can see the other structures. So again, keep in mind order when it actually comes time to do the exam on a patient. We've actually set Kristen up for a very common position here. You're very used to it, it's a KUB. Patient is AP, not rotated. Iliac crest is to the center of the film and the MSPs to the center of the film. You do use a right marker, ID to the bottom. Uh, this would be an AP, simply a KUB. I want you to keep in mind when you do colon exams that most of the pathological uh, conditions will occur in the distal area, the sigmo sigmoid rectal area. So it's very important not to clip the anus, okay? Even with a tall patient, you will do iliac crest to the center of the film. You want to include the rectum. It's okay if you clip flexures because you're going to be doing oblique positions for the purpose of opening up those flexures. Plus the radiologists have usually done spots of the uh, flexures themselves. Most disease processes happen distally. Do not clip the rectum. Stay with your iliac crest to the center of the film even with a large habitus. Now our patient today is, is a sthenic habitus and her colon will fit very easily lengthwise on a 14 by 17 film. But what happens if she is a larger patient? Well, your scalp film that you took at the beginning of the series, which is a KUB, uh, refer to that scalp film. And the scalp film will help you identify where the gas pattern is. And if you see the colon on the very edges of the film on a 14 by 17, the chances that that colon will expand off the edge of the film because of barium filling it, it's great. If you see colon on the edge of the film, instead of going lengthwise, turn your film crosswise and do one low to include the rectum and then make sure you do one high to include the other part of the, the colon and then you make sure the film's edge uh, covers each other so, so you don't clip each other, so that overlaps. So you may be doing these crosswise, but the body habitus will be a decision and your scalp film will help you make that determination. Scalp film also serves a good purpose on evaluating your density and contrast levels and it helps to determine if the patient was able to evacuate the colon adequately, removing fecal material so the doctors can see a, a good, ex have a good examination of the colon. Uh, the physicians will usually let you know if the patient's cleansing was adequate or not, but you know how to tell fecal material from gas. Gas patterns are the solid black areas. Fecal materials are that mottled, mottled appearance. But the radiologist will let you know if the patient has cleaned out enough to proceed with the exam. So scalp film is just like an AP. It will let you know if you can do these lengthwise on one film. It will also let you know if you need to do two on a crosswise mode, one high, one low. Okay, both obliques I'm going to demonstrate uh, sometimes the protocol calls for one oblique, sometimes both obliques. 
I'm only going to demonstrate uh, posterior obliques, but you may run across anterior obliques. The criteria will be the same that we're going to discuss now. I'm going to change film so I have a new 14 by 17. And the enema tip and cord is still connected with the patient. So it's logical for me to do my RPO first and then do the LPO into the left lateral mode, et cetera. Okay? So we're going to reach your arm across, bend this knee, and just have your patient roll like a log. It's not a good idea for you to tell the patient to turn up onto their right side. They tend to curl up and then, then you have to straighten them all up again. Bringing their arm across, bending this knee, and rolling them like a log will actually save you time. We're going to center the colon to the center of the film. That means it's approximately a couple inches off of the ASIS. Body habit test will actually dictate how far forward or how far back you are. Ballinger's just tells you to center the colon. And I'm giving you a little bit better reference or a little bit more specific reference in that use the ASIS and be a couple inches anterior to the upside. That generally puts the spine to the center. If the colon is, if the abdomen is loose and the colon is falling forward, of course you're going to have to move the patient more that way. But if you take a look here, I've got collimated light on this. If I were to center her more that way, I'm x-raying tabletop. That doesn't make sense. That's not valuable information. Her bot, I actually have light on this edge of the body, and I have light on this edge of the body. I'm not missing any colon at all, and I'm approximately two inches anterior to her ASIS. Now, the iliac crest is a reference mark. Again, it's important to get the rectum on. But the purpose for the obliques is to open up the flexures. An RPO position, right posterior side down, will demonstrate the left colic flexure, or the left the splenic flexure. And if you recall from anatomy previously, with the liver on the right side, the hepatic flexure tends to be a little lower. The splenic flexure tends to be a little higher. So instead of being right at the iliac crest for an RPO, we just go one inch above, kind of compromising, knowing that the splenic flexure is the point of interest, and because it's generally higher, we just centered a little higher for it. The patient is between a 35 and 45 degree oblique. They are straight on the table, shoulders and hips at the same degree of obliquity, and I'm using a right marker. Again, the purpose for the 35 to 45 degree oblique is to open up the up side flexure, and in this case, it would be the splenic. Okay, patient can go on to their back. Change films. And if we're going to do a left oblique, we're going to use a left marker. Please bend your right knee for me a little bit and her right arm goes across, you oblique the patient 35 to 45 degrees. This arm to your side, elbow up please, that's good. And you're going to center the body side to side. Again, you're going to use that ASIS and be approximately two inches to the right of it, or excuse me, to the anterior side of the ASIS. I'm looking at the collimated light and seeing that her body is centered. And I'm going to use the iliac crest. I'm going to be centered right at the level of the iliac crest because I'm after the hepatic flexure, which is lower. So I'm going to stay right at the level of the iliac crest. Okay? Patient can go up onto their left side. I'm rolling the patient in a logical order. And you may elect to do your lateral rectum at this point in time. Some techs will actually choose to do the lateral rectum at the very end of the series. So when it is time to drop the enema bag to the floor and allow the drain back, the patient's already in that position. So that would be a preference that you would have uh, with your protocol. Bucky trays often eat markers. That's what happened here, but we found it. 10 by 12 lengthwise for the lateral rectum.
Patient needs to be in a lateral position, straight on the table, shoulders and pelvis lateral. I'm going to find the iliac crest, and the film's edge is going to be approximately one inch above the iliac crest. Very similar to a lateral sacrum coccyx. The crest is one inch below the film's edge. I'm going to take a look at the bottom edge of the film and see how, evaluate how much tabletop I might be x-raying. And I think you can see from here that I'm not going to be x-raying too much tabletop. The anus, the rectum is probably right about there. You don't have to touch the patient or look. You can tell from the uh, buttocks there. And I'm happy with the vertical placement. You can also use the ASIS. And here's Kristen's ASIS, and you can see with me guesstimating the film's edge one inch above, I'm only just off her ASIS just a little bit, so I'm very, very satisfied with the front, or excuse me, the top and the bottom centering. Not x-raying too much tabletop, film's edge one inch above the iliac crest, almost right at the level of the ASIS. Front to back, you can actually put the mid-coronal plane to the center of the film. Okay. Remember the, the rectal sigmoid colon is anterior to the sacrum, and the sacrum is right here. Sacrum is right there, so I'm centered in front of the sacrum, actually right at the mid-coronal plane. That would be a lateral rectum. Okay. Patient will go on to their tummy. Another routine position is your PA. That's another KUB. But it's a posterior KUB. 14 by 17 collimation. Left marker for patient's left side. Straighten the patient up. You want to do these positions very quickly. Think about you having barium in your colon. So you want to be quick at your positioning. Mid-sagittal plane to the center of the film. Feel crest posteriorly. Put the center of the film to the iliac crest, exiting to the center of the film. And that would be the PA. Now, there are going to be protocols that include a PA sigmoid or an AP sigmoid. Those are actually main focus is the sigmoid colon. Sigmoid colon, the words in itself, means S-shape. Sigmoid means S-shape. We're going to put a caudal or a cephalic tube angle on the tube, depending on the patient's position, in order to straighten out that S, in order to make the sigmoid colon elongate. With the patient in a PA position, we're going to have a caudal tube angle of 35 degrees. You adjust your vertical placement of the gauge to 33, 5 into uh, 35 is 7, 7 from 40 is 33. So the gauge says 33, but you're maintaining that 40 inches. The film and the tube become aligned again. See, I've got the alignment here. Make sure your tube goes back transversely centered. You can push the film in. Mid-sagittal plane stays to the center of the film. And you have your iliac crest. And the central ray enters approximately one inch below the iliac crest. This will actually put it exiting through the level of the ASIS to the center of the film. The main focus, again, is the sigmoid colon, the uh, 35 degree caudal tube angle is to straighten out the S of the sigmoid. Now, more commonly, some things that we're seeing in the field is that the doctors are requesting a slight degree of obliquity. They might do a 15 degree RAO for the sigmoid. So, if they do a slight 15 degrees, you'd still center one inch below the iliac crest but you center the body side to side if they're wanting a slight obliquity for the rectosigmoid colon. Okay? And then the, the other way, they would do both obliques. Again, slight
light 15 degrees, but your entering point would be the same vertically. So I'm not going to demonstrate the other oblique to you. Um, Kristen, let's, you wouldn't do this logically in the, ho in the hospitals because we're going to flip the patients like this. But just for following through with the PA sigmoid, could you turn on to your back, please? If their doctors requested an AP sigmoid, patient reverses, the tube angle degree reverses. Instead of being 35 degree caudal, we're now 35 degree cephalic. And patient is straight on the table. Readjust your film in your tube so they align. Mid-sagittal plane to the center of the film, entering at the level of the ASIS. Okay, mid-sagittal plane is to the center of the film, entering at the level of the ASIS. This would be an AP, uh, rectal, AP sigmoid, but the doctors may request a slight oblique again, just very slightly, Arm up, please. That's good. Shoulders and pelvis together. Readjust your side to side centering and then come in at the level of the ASIS again. Okay? Okay, we're going to talk for a few minutes and I'm going to position you some more. Those are generally the basic positions that you're going to see with a single contrast very minima. Very uh, commonly when there's uh, blood as a symptom, the patient complains of bleeding, the radiologist will do an air contrast or double contrast study. And some departments actually will do double contrast studies on a routine basis. The positions just previously demonstrated focused on the common ones for a single contrast study. In the event you're doing double contrast, which is high density barium and air, means two contrast mediums. The colon is, is excessively enlarged. Patient is even more uncomfortable. You do need to do quickly, but there's a couple additional views that might be done for um, air contrast studies. One would be an upright abdomen. And I'm not going to demonstrate that to you today because an upright abdomen for a barium study of the colon would be exactly like an upright abdomen for um, abdomen series, but you'd be centered a little lower. Again, do not clip uh, the rectum, so it would be an upright KUB, and make sure you use an upright marker with that. But I do want to demonstrate decubitus to you. Um, we're going to pause for a second and set up here. We took a minute to realign the camera angle so you could see the patient in the left lateral position. Our tube can only come from one direction. So we're actually going to shoot AP, and I've got her into a true lateral position. I want you to focus what she's lying on, though, right now. There's a blanket. Krista, maybe you can move this arm in. We've got her built up on a blanket. Um, let's step back in our brains for a minute. If she was lying on her back, and I knew as a technologist I was going to go into the lateral to cube modes, I'd actually have her lying on her back, and then I would have a blanket folded up, and I would bring it very close to her left side. And then when she rolled up onto the lateral position, she'd actually roll right onto the blanket. You do need that colon built up or you're going to clip pertinent anatomy. So building them up on a blanket or a sponge is absolutely critical. And the film here is now down below the blanket. On this back side, you can't see it. But we've got to drop the film's edge lower than the patient or we're going to clip the downside of the anatomy. Well, you would actually end up doing both decubituses here, a right and a left lateral. In this situation here, I have the ID towards the caudal end, and I'm going to use the left and the decube markers here, and I'm going to place them on the very lateral edge, clear down at the bottom at the caudal end. I have 40 inches SID, measure with the tape, this way, you know how you measure that way, 40 inches. She's in a true lateral position. I have the iliac crest to the center of the film. Kristen, can you reach the collimated light? There you go. 
and I'm to the center of the grid this way, seven and a half inches up, and I've collimated to the field edge here. And this would be a left lateral decube, very similar to an abdomen decubitus, but I have the patient built up on a blanket. And um, colon work, uh, very similar to a lot of the other positions that you've used, but we are using a high KVP technique throughout all of the GI series here, high KVP technique, so we can penetrate the mucosal lining. I'm not going to demonstrate a right lateral, but you would have to reverse things and again have her roll up onto a protected sponge. I am going to demonstrate a, uh, going to put the patient into a prone position because sometimes you will be doing a decubitus for the, the lateral rectum. So we're going to let Kristen go onto her tummy and she doesn't need the sponge now for the lateral rectum because the actual rectum will be up off of the, the cassette. And I'm going to switch to a 10 by 12. Use a grid. Now if the patient is very, very slender, very low to the table, you might have to build them up. If they're very large, you might have to build the cassette up. You've got to think about where the rectum is, and it's just anterior to the sacrum. Kristen is about average. We're going to see how this shakes out once I get it centered here. Kristen, can you reach the, the light for me? Okay. And here's her crest. I'm going to put the film's edge one inch above the crest. Here's the film's edge and one inch above the crest. Looking at the bottom edge and I'm seeing quite a bit of quite a bit of not colon area so I'm going to slide it up just a little bit. Then I'm happy with that. I have my 40 inches. I'm going to step in front of the camera, excuse me for a second, because I have to realign the centering of the tube to have it come through the center of the cassette and vertically I've got to go to the center of the grid. And then you collimate down. And that's actually a left lateral, so I'd have a left decubitus marker on there, same position I did in the other one. And this would be a decubitus for the rectum. Again, you've got to use some common sense. If the patient is large, you might have to move the film up. If the patient is tiny, you might have to build the patient up. The mid-coronal plane will be approximately to the center of the film. And 40 inches SID, appropriate collimation. Those are the various positions for a colon exam. When you're done with the procedure, the patient will go to the restroom. Um, if they're able to walk, get them to the bathroom as soon as possible. If they're um, not very mobile, it's a great idea to allow some of the barium to drain back into the, the bag until the patient is mobile, uh, safe enough to reach to the bathroom and empty the colon. Most doctors will ask for some type of post-evacuation film. Might be an AP, it might be another sigmoid, um, might be a, an, another oblique. So we've shown you the various positions. Just remember that when barium goes into the colon, the colon will go up and go out. And with an evacuation film, the colon will be more back down into a natural position. So if you've altered your positioning and gone crosswise with filled films, you may not need to do that with the evacuation films. Um, the obliques, you may have to do them crosswise as well. Again, the Patient anatomy will dictate a lot of your decisions that you've made, but hopefully after today you'll have a good basis for the general positioning guidelines for elementary track, and uh, have a great day.